pleasure to be here um, and an honor to be the moderating the first session. Uh, my name is Kim Schoenholtz. I'm a professor of management practice in the economics department over at Stern. Uh, and I direct another center, the Center on Global Economy and Business uh, at Stern. Uh, today we have a really extraordinary uh, group of panelists. Uh, let me begin by introducing uh, the two who are sitting to my left. Uh, Nicholas Borst is an analyst in the Country Analysis Unit within the Division of Financial Institutions Supervision and Credit at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, he conducts research into Asian financial and economic issues and monitors related developments with a special focus on Greater China and South Asia. Uh, prior to uh, his work at the Federal Reserve, Mr. Borst was a research associate and the China program manager at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He's also worked as an analyst at the World Bank. Uh, Douglas Elliott, to his left, uh, is a partner in the financial services consulting practice uh, at Oliver Wyman uh, in, here in New York. Uh, previously, he spent seven years at the Brookings Institution, uh, where he focused on the financial sector uh, and its regulation. Uh, he also worked for almost two decades, primarily at J.P. Morgan, uh, as an investment banker for financial institutions. Uh, he founded and acted as lead researcher for the Center on Federal Financial Institutions, a think tank devoted to the study of U.S. federal lending and insurance activities. So without further ado, we'll begin uh, alphabetically. That means Nick uh, is first. Uh, we have a 12-minute limit for panelists and their presentations, and I'm supposed to yank the cord when they're done. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, happy to participate in this event. Um, my name is Nick Borst. I'm an analyst at the San Francisco Fed, uh, primarily working on China, but also a bit on the rest of Asia. Today, I thought I would talk about China's financial reform agenda. And before I get going, I have to give our standard disclaimer that the opinions in this presentation are mine and do not necessarily represent either the San Francisco Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So to take stock of China's financial reform agenda, I thought it would be useful to go back to the third plenum. And as many of you know, the third plenum was a very important party congress that took place in November 2013. And one of the things that came out of this uh, party congress was the decision on major issues concerning comprehensively deepening reforms. And what this document did was basically lay out the priorities for the Xi Li administration on a whole range of topics. but. Um, also including the financial system. So I'm going to try to take the financial system reforms and, and divide them into three broad categories and then assess how far we've come on implementing some of those reforms. So first, looking at the financial reforms in the third plenum as they relate to banks. I think one of the most important things laid out uh, with regard to, to banks was looking at establishing um, private banks in China. And as you know, uh, the Chinese financial system is overwhelmingly state dominated. And so to allow private banks to set up their own uh, institutions was, was a real breakthrough. And we've actually seen the CBRC now permit four different private banks to, to set up business. Now, they're a bit constrained in terms of business lines. They're still very small compared to the big state owned banks. But I think this is a very important reform for China. The second reform was. Uh, uh, really restructuring the policy banks. And we saw last year that the State Council finally approved a reform plan for China's development banks, um, specifically looking at adjusting their lines of business, controlling risks, and then we also saw a big recapitalization of the policy banks using foreign reserves. Another reform was accelerating interest rate liberalization. And so over the past couple of years, we've seen a series of steps to uh, remove interest rate controls in China, um, specifically looking at uh, controls on the deposit rate. This has been a, a goal of the party for many, many years. And in, within the last year, we finally have seen uh, the removal of controls on deposit rates. Now, it's true that the PBOC still exercises pretty um, significant indirect influence on interest rates in China, but I still think this is a pretty significant big th breakthrough. On a related issue is looking at deposit insurance and uh, you know, China is one of the largest financial systems in the world, but was a real outlier in terms of not having deposit insurance. Um, it had been on the policy agenda for decades, and we finally saw over the past year the establishment of a deposit insurance agency. Now, we're still waiting on some of the details in terms of implementation, uh, resolution authority, that type of thing, 
But again, I think this is a, a significant reform that we've seen in the past two years. And then the final issue related to banking is um, what they call improving a market-based exit regime. And what this means is basically, can banks fail in China? And I think this is the component where we've seen the littlest uh, progress being made. Uh, too big to fail is still the rule rather than the exception in China. And I think all except the smallest banks are still subject to that rule. Now moving on to the third plenum uh, reforms that relate to capital markets, I think it's much more of a mixed bag here. Uh, looking at uh, registration, uh, stock issuing system, this really means can China move from a explicit approval system to IPOs to more of a registration system that most countries have where if you have your paperwork in order, you can proceed with an IPO. You don't need special approval from the CSRC. I think this has been completely derailed by what we saw, uh, all the turmoil in financial markets over the past year. There's some talk that this might come back onto the agenda, but I think we'll just have to wait and see. Another reform is promoting equity financing through diverse channels. This is really getting at creating opportunities for small and medium enterprises to access equity financing. And while there's still work to be done on this, I think a lot has been done, um, particularly with expanding the third board and other small exchanges to allow um, SMEs to raise equity financing. A lot of significant progress has been made on developing the bond market. Uh, China now has the largest corporate bond market in Asia. We've also seen uh, developments on the government side of things with uh, local governments working with the central government to convert bank loans into corporate bonds. Uh, the next item, ensuring that financial markets operate in a safe, efficient, and stable way. I think given what we saw in the stock market over the summer, uh, it's still quite a bit of work to be done on that. And then finally, increasing the proportion of direct financing. So this just really means can China move away from having a really bank loan do dominated financial system towards having more corporate bond financing and more equity financing. And if you look at this chart here, you can see while both corporate bond and equity financing have been growing quite quickly, shown on the left-hand side, if you look at the right-hand side as a share of total finance, it's still pretty small. So some progress has been made on this, but China is still very much a bank loan dominated financial system. Now looking at the third plenum financial reforms related to international issues, uh, I think one of the most important was this uh, commitment to move towards a market-based exchange rate. And in my opinion, there's been fairly, fairly significant progress on this in terms of widening the trading ban for the RMB and the PBOC committing to a new uh, exchange rate setting mechanism using the previous day's closing price. Looking at uh, cross-border capital market investment, um, we have seen some progress in that in terms of the um, Shanghai Hong Kong Connect program allowing investors both in Hong Kong and, and Shanghai to trade stocks within a quota on each other's exchanges. We're now hearing talk about a, a Shenzhen Hong Kong uh, Connect program that would operate along similar lines. On a related reform is uh, accelerating capital account convertibility. Here we've seen increases in the quotas given to foreign in investors to invest in Chinese securities. We've also seen a move to let uh, foreign central banks and sovereign wealth funds invest directly in China's interbank market. And then finally, uh, relaxing foreign investment controls in the service sector. Um, I and many others believe that China's future growth is going to be very dependent on opening up its service sector to investment. And unfortunately, I haven't seen that much progress here. I know there were some tweaks to the foreign investment catalog, and we see some experimentation in the Shanghai free trade zone. But really, uh, in my opinion, the progress here has been limited so far. Now, there's some also some things that are on the agenda that weren't necessarily in the third plenum, and I thought I would just cover those quickly. Um, one of the most important is controlling the risks in the shadow banking system. Shadow banking in China has grown very, very quickly over the past several years. I think it's dawned on policymakers how big some of the risks were, and I think they've taken some very useful measures to control those risks. Related to that is moderating the overall growth rate of credit, where uh, in an effort to fight off some of the negative economic effects of the global financial crisis, China sort of opened the floodgates for lending. I think this did have a very useful economic effect, but now we're dealing with the legacy of very, very rapid credit growth. Related to that is, I believe we're facing a cycle now of increasing non-performing loans. And while uh, the headline numbers are still pretty low, it, it's growing quite quickly and a, an issue of concern. 
Another issue on the agenda is establishing the renminbi as a um, global currency. Uh, many of you probably noticed the big news that we had uh, earlier about the SDR. And beyond, I think, that headline news, there's been a lot of significant work going on in the financial infrastructure necessary for the renminbi to really emerge as a global currency. And then finally, this is more in the realm of, of rumors. We haven't seen many policy documents on this, but there's a lot of buzz right now about whether it makes sense in China to consolidate the financial regulators, whether you take the banking regulator, the insurance regulator, and the securities regulator and form them into one consolidated financial regulator. And that's actually the model a couple other Asian economies use, so it might make sense for China. Now, just a couple of charts, I think, to uh, reinforce these points. I think if you look here, you can see really what I talked about earlier, the tremendous growth rate in credit that we saw in China, and then the shift that we've seen in the past uh, year, year and a half. And specifically, if you look at this top line, that's non-bank credit growth, the sort of shadow banking part of the financial system, which is much smaller, but has been growing very rapidly. And over the past year and a half, we've seen a very sharp slowdown in, in both that and total credit growth. Um, unfortunately, the credit to GDP ratio in China continues to climb, but a lot of that is a measure of how quickly also nominal GDP growth has slowed. So it's, it's an issue of concern, but I think they have done a lot of work um, reducing excessive credit growth. And then as I mentioned from this um, really rapid growth rate of credit that we've seen over the past couple of years, I think we're entering a worsening credit cycle. And the very bottom line here is the NPL ratio. And you can see it really hasn't budged that much, but I think a lot of that is the denominator effect of total loans have been growing so quickly that even though non-performing loans have been increasing, it hasn't really showed up in the number. But if you look at the absolute amounts, which are these purple bars here, you can see there's been a pretty steep increase in non-performing loans, and I would expect that to continue. So finally, I'll just leave you with uh, my outlook for these issues. I think it's natural that as Chinese economic growth slows, that some of the impetus for reform will also slow down. I think the costs associated with reform become harder to bear when the economy isn't quite doing as well. Um, I believe significant vulnerabilities remain both in the banking system and capital markets, although I think Chinese policymakers are mostly aware of those. I think China's increasing openness to international capital flows raises issues for policymakers in a way that they haven't necessarily had to deal with before. China is more integrated into global financial markets than it's ever been in its history, and this trend is going to continue. And I think to, to end on an optimistic note, despite these concerns, I think what we hear from the leadership is very strong support for financial reform, both from the technocratic side of, the, of Chinese leadership and the political side. So, I think if we take them at their word, we should continue to expect um, real progress on these economic reforms. And one final thing, I just have to plug our uh, Asia program at the San Francisco Fed. We do a variety of research pieces, both long and short, um, not only on China, but all of Asia's major economies. Thank you very much.